welcome to Betariel congregation. Welcome to those who are listening on YouTube and a special shalom to uh, those in Philippines who are uh, listening to us. Nora actually, who uh, I know is listening to us every Saturday. God bless you. Blessings to you and your family and the people of the Philippines. You know, lately in Zakaria, we've been learning quite a bit about angels, how they are present and how they, they minister to, to believers. Okay, and you know, after the snowstorm uh, we had last week, I heard some interesting stories. You know, one of them is about uh, Claire. Claire, who is in her 80s, was uh, stuck in a snowbank and could not get out, get out of it. You know, her car was stuck there for a while. She says that as she tried to pull out, suddenly uh, one man came, all smiling, and pushed the car, out, the car out completely with no much effort, right? And there she left. But she says that he didn't look to be that strong to have pushed the car out, right? Could it have been an angel? Yes. I believe it. <laughs> I believe. Why not? You know, they, they are ministering angels. They've been to the prophets. Why not to the believers today? We don't always see them. You know, I believe that angels are very active in this world. We don't see them. We don't need to see them. But we can recognize the gracious hand of God in allowing them to minister to each one of us. Also, the news, you know, week after week, uh, do not stop to, to, to follow a path of the end time prophecies. And there's one thing we increasingly see, one thing that comes out. The nation of Israel is slowly being isolated more and more. You know, this past week on Wednesday, and for the first time, the UN Human Rights Council published a database of 112 Israeli companies and says are conducting business in the West Bank, right? and they blacklist them worldwide. Among the more well-known companies are Motorola, General Mills, Airborne, and uh, TripAdvisor. But who is member? What are these countries of the, of the 47 countries? You know who's there? You have Iran, you have Iraq, Venezuela, Turkey, Afghanistan, Egypt, Iceland, who is a very anti-Semitic country. You know, the, you know, in the world, there are 57 Muslim states about about 100 Christian states, six Buddhist states, but only one Jewish state, and, and, and it's being targeted and isolated just like the prophecy tells us will happen at the end. Isaiah, Zechariah, that is 12.3. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for the people. All nations of the earth will gather against it. We're starting to see this. Even within its own people. You know, this past week again, I read that a group of Jewish students at Harvard University formed the Harvard Jewish Coalition for Peace. The coalition builds itself as an anti-Zionist Jewish organization. It focused, they say, on countering anti-Semitism through supporting the enemies of Israel. I don't know how they figured this one out. They go against the state of Israel to counter out anti-Semitism. I thought they were smart. They are, but maybe not wise. I think they're doing this out of pressure and fear of the, of the pressure of the world that they're feeling, especially there in the universities. You know, these are Jews against Israel, and it comes from a well-established Harvard University. Furthermore, you know, a recent a 2019 survey shows that 28% of American Jews do not think that the state of Israel is vital for uh, the long-term future of the Jewish people. That is, they don't like it, right? You see how Israel is being alienated more and more. And this is what we're going to study, especially and see in the book of Zechariah. Let's open up our Bible to Zechariah chapter 4, where today's news meets prophecies. One of the most passionate and also intricate study of the Bible is prophecy. While the study of prophecy called also eschatology, represent over one quarter of the scriptures, it is spread out in almost every one of the 66 books of the Bible, so that one needs to gather this precious information by digging everywhere in order to make it a whole, to have a full picture of a prophetic event. And our book of Zachariah is very much like a prophetic hub, right, which launches us everywhere else in the world, and especially our section today. Let me begin with one of Aesop's uh, parables, which we can apply in the study, not only of prophecy, but of the whole word of God. The story is about a crow who was out in the wilderness and very thirsty. 
He had not had anything to drink in a long time. He came to a jug who had little water at the bottom of it. The crow reached its beak into the jug to get some of that water, but his beak couldn't quite touch the water. So what did he do? He started picking up pebbles one at a time and dropping them into the jug. And as more and more pebbles accumulated in the bottom of the jug, the water rose okay, in the bottle until finally the crow was able to drink all that it desired. The story is a good illustration on how one accumulates knowledge of prophecy, for instance, little by little until a beautiful canvas emerges. However, there will always be a little water at the very bottom in between these stones placed, you know, one places one cannot really get there, which means there always be something, always something new to discover day after day. At the end, the study of eschatology is an ever lively and dynamic study of the Bible, which at the end will leave you with such a strong anticipation for this moment when the believer will finally meet God. Did you know that? That you will actually meet Jesus face to face, right? And so prophecies, at the end, this is what the, 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 the thing that they put in our heart. So today we're about to look into what is considered a most solemn and mysterious scene in prophecies. The two witnesses, which will appear at one time during the seven-year period of the tribulation. The last seven years of Daniel prophecy of 490 years, and we are fast approaching the end of these prophecies, or at least the beginning of these seven years. These two individuals will be so successful that their missions, as the book of Revelation tells us, they will be endowed with so much power as never seen before, especially in convincing and bringing so many people to a saving knowledge of Yeshua, so much so that it would disturb the Antichrist and the whole world, as we're going to see. Who are these two individuals? Their identity begins here in Zechariah chapter 4 and then flows right into Revelation chapter 11. At this point, Zechariah follows the same pattern as Revelation. There in Revelation, the introduction of the two witnesses is followed by the pouring out of the most severe vials or bowls, and there begins the final wars leading to Armageddon. With the mention of the two witnesses, Zachariah as well brings us right into the final hours of the seven-year tribulation. In the following chapter in Zachariah chapter 5, we see the account of a flying scroll with all the judgment written on it, which were about to fall on the earth. And then we are introduced to a sort of basket, an ephah, a basket containing what is called wickedness. The wickedness, the only time wickedness is with an article. And it is brought right in the Middle East, in Babylon, and there it is let out. And in chapter 6 begins the final wars of the force, four horsemen. But in all this, there's a bright side to it, a very comforting one. For God is present, full of grace, carefully assigning the event, one after the other one. And he does it until the very last second, I believe, of the seven-year period, because he wants everyone to come to believe. Let us then begin our journey into these two sections of Zachariah and Revelation chapter 11. We will start by resuming this powerful chapter 4 of Zachariah. You know, at the beginning, Zachariah sees a menorah, a golden menorah with two olive trees, one on each side, and a large bowl on top with as many as 14 out spouts feeding the menorah. On the screen is an illustration which somehow looks like the vision he saw. This painting was found on a, on a Bible, Cervera Bible in Spain in the 12th century. But what does the whole thing represent? What is it? Zachariah asks... And a first answer is given to him in verse 6. When he is told to tell Zerubbabel, the leader responsible to build and prepare the temple for the first coming of Yeshua with the words, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of God. Affirming that the spirit of God symbolizes by the oil will through Zerubbabel build the temple and usher the first coming of Yeshua by the power of God. Then Zachariah looks again at the same menorah, 
and olive tree and sees even more details. It's like, you know, one who reads the Bible. The more you read and the more you see. It's always a progressive revelation and always tailored for the individuals. The prophet saw the same scene twice, but at the second time he saw something else, something wonderful. At his second sight, he does not see the tree, but he is brought to focus on two branches from where the oil flows. And in verse 12, he seems surprised and says, Why are these two olive branches of ear of wheat, which are besides the two golden pipes which empty the gold from themselves? Notice these words which seem out of place. Ear of wheat, gold from an olive tree. What he sees are two branches, and perhaps at the tip he sees what he calls shibboleth, which are the ear of grain or wheat. So rich it is, and see that it is pouring out into the menorah, Zachariah calls, what, what is it? Gold itself. This is when you stop visualizing the illustration and concentrate on this element, ear of grain, gold, the powerful light, all flowing from this menorah. This is when the angel challenges Zachariah in verse 13, and he says, don't you know what these things are? And surely in awe, in front of this great scene, the prophet says, no, sir, I don't. Right? And we suck in this answer. We don't. Until the angel gives this powerful identification of the menorah, which has so much flowing through it that the light shines even more. There the angel says in verse 14, you can see your scriptures as well. 414, powerful verse. These are the two sons of oil which stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Notice how the two witnesses are now called the sons of oil. A new title here in the scriptures. Perhaps because there's so much of the power of the Spirit flowing through them that they are so in line and in touch with the will of God. This title could be read as sons of the spirit, perhaps. So linked they are with God. And see that since the beginning, the full trinity is engaged. The Lord of hosts, the Messiah as, as the head of the army of, of heaven, and here the spirit. And with this verse 14, the account seems to have reached an apex, a, a peak in Zachariah. While the two witnesses here in the book are Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest, the religious leader, this description goes beyond them. And it is the same verse that is carried right through Revelation chapter 11 to identify the two witnesses that are soon coming. And there we can better associate its power, the two individuals, there are so much, by the way, information given to us about these two individuals that are coming. Let me bring you to Revelation chapter 11. You can open up your scriptures there too. You know, after measuring the temple of the tribulation, just like Zachariah in Zachariah, we have previously seen, we are here introduced to these two witnesses, verses 3 and 4. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. You know, verse 4 is a quotation of the last verse of Zechariah 4. These are the two sons of oil who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Who are these two witnesses which are soon coming in the world scene? Before we try to identify them, let us see more of the correlation between these two great books of Zachariah and Revelation and see how they link together. You know, with Zachariah, the second, second temple is measured. With Revelation, as we have seen in verses 1 and 2, the third temple is also measured. And in both instances, both witnesses are introduced. In both instances, Satan is present. We see him accusing Joshua the high priest in chapter 3. And in Revelation, he acts and energizes his two witnesses, the Antichrist and the false prophet. He gave authority to the beast, 13.4. On the false prophet, we read that he exercises all the authority of the first beast, chapter 13, verse 12. And notice that as one witness, one witness that is, is a political leader, Zerubbabel in Zechariah, right? And the other's religious leader, Joshua, 
the high priest. So are Satan's two workers, two witnesses. The Antichrist, a political leader, and the false prophet, a religious leader. Could we see here the Antichrist and the false prophet as an imitation of the two witnesses of God? We know that evil is never original because it is itself a cheat, a deceit. It always needs to draw from the source, the true source, to mimic what is true and right. And if so, the four of them, the two witnesses of God and those of Satan, will find themselves in the same city, in the same very place on the Temple Mount, and at the same very time. What we are told in Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 to 4, about these two witnesses to whom so much power is given, for they will definitely need to, to have this power to confront the most powerful manifestation of evil. First notice that, that the time of the testimony is limited to 1260 days. The number occurs again in the next chapter, Revelation 12, 6. It is the time when God will hide the remnant of Israel from the wrath of Satan. It will be a time when he will find out that he's caught in the net. As we read in Revelation 12, 12, he says, For the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. If then the 1260 days represent the same time, the two witnesses need all the power they need to confront an angry Satan. These 1260 days represent exactly three and a half years according to biblical calendar. And they also represent 42 months, the number we find in Revelation 11, when the temple is measured and we're told that the nation will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Which all brings us to the last part of the tribulation during the final wars. This number is also found in Revelation 13:2, which limits the wrath of the devil through the Antichrist only for 42 months. You know, don't get lost in these numbers. They are all there to tell us that God limits the damages and at the same time allows time for many to repent. You know, Let's pause just for a minute to realize that during these 1260 days or 40 months or three and a half years are concentrated the greater part of all end time prophecies. This main subject of the Hebrew scriptures, which is prophecies, are concentrated mainly on three and a half years. This time is called in the Old Testament the day of the Lord. It is mentioned 80 times in the whole of the scriptures. Zephaniah hammers home the message that the day of the Lord is the day of final judgment. Zephaniah 1.14 says, The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, it hastens quickly. And right after Jesus comes. Joel's, Joel's theme, actually, the whole book is on the day of the Lord. We read in Joel 1.15, Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a distraction from the Almighty. And then Jesus comes. Jeremiah has another title for this day. It's called Jacob's Trouble. But he has, it shall be saved out of it. A remnant of Israel will be. Daniel, in his last chapter, he says that there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And you know who quotes that verse? Our Lord and Savior Yeshua in Matthew 24, 21. He says, for then there will be Great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And he comes back right after. The tribulation period will witness the wrath of Satan in his animosity against Israel and against the nations. It will be the most severe time of judgment that ever fell on this earth. In the New Testament, the closely related term is the day of Christ. The day of the Messiah, it relates mainly to the rewards and blessings of the saints. You know why? Because the believers will not be going through the tribulation. The rapture comes before because the tribulation is a time of judgment. Jesus took the judgment from us. But as terrible as all this is, you can see grace. Why so many warnings uh, for three and a half years? You know, God could do it. In a, in a one day. You know why? Because God cares. 
As Peter says, our great and wonderful God is long-suffering, that is, he's patient toward us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3.9. And why three and a half years again? Again, God could have ended in half a day. You know why? Again, because he cares so much. And when he cares, things happen. In fact, it would be during the time of the tribulation, the greatest evangelical campaign in history that history ever saw. Right? This we will see when we look at the flying scroll over all the earth, which is actually the word of God, giving to all at the last attempt. It would be a last attempt to save them. And so many will respond. You know that John sees them in heaven? And he says, I can't see them. I can't count them, that is. I can't count them. There are so many of them. And this is what the term 1,260 days brings us to mind in the context of the whole scriptures. And see that at this time, how the two witnesses are dressed. At the end of verse 3 of Revelation 11, we read they are clothed in sackcloth all the time. All the time. Sackcloth is a sign of individual mourning and national distress when a prophet towards them. The two witnesses will be in sackcloth for three and a half years. So to constantly remind the people that this is the last warning. This is the last act of grace. This is when we come to the fourth verse about the two witnesses and their identification. Who are they? While Revelation quotes Zachariah, John adds one more element in Zachariah. We see one menorah in Zachariah, right? But we see two menorahs in Revelation. You know what? I want to tell you, it's hard to figure out why. I don't fully understand why, but perhaps it has to do with the intensity of the battle and the very presence uh, of all the forces of evil then. So perhaps God doubles his blessings in having not one, but two menorahs represented by the two witnesses. This tells us much about their great powers. And also, being two menorahs may speak of the never-seen power of evangelization and of support for the believers at that time. Where sin is, right, grace much more abounds. And with the witnesses in Zechariah, these will stand, it says in both verses, beside the Lord of the whole earth, as their power will demonstrate. Now, in order to, to understand, I'll go again, the the power they're given, notice Revelation 11, 7, what it says. The beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them. Imagine these two witnesses will be the primary target of the Antichrist who is seen coming from the abyss. Abyss, this is the word for bottomless pit. To make war with them as he comes to do just that. He will go after these two witnesses because you know that without witnesses, there cannot be a fair judgment. So it is possible that he will put all his might to wipe out the two witnesses, knowing that his time is near. But see how the passage begins with the words, when they finish their testimony, right? Then he could kill them, he will. We're going to see that, right? But before that, they would have spoken the word of God to the whole world. This is why... We can interpret the, the power given to them as literal power. When it says, you know, it says that fire proceeds from their mouth to, de to devour their enemies. This is difficult also to interpret. Is this real power, real fire? Considering they will be the prime target of the Antichrist, they're going to need this power. But it is also true spiritually. It is Jeremiah 5.14, one of my favorite verse, where the prophet where God tells the prophet, Behold, I will make my words in your mouth like fire. And these people would, and it shall devour them. Right? In this sense, so many will come to believe their powerful words. The powerful words of God, that is. And they will accept Yeshua. This is where the words of Zechariah 4, 6, again, take all their meaning. Right? Not by might, not by power, but by Ruach HaKodesh, says the Lord. And it works wonderfully. And will give them, he will give them such power that at the end, when they die, by the way, uh, and before their resurrection, we're told, and listen to this in verse 10. 
Revelation 11.10, And those who dwell in the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now for them to rejoice to such a point, and even send gifts to each other, like Purim, like it was their Purim, just shows how powerful the ministry of these two witnesses will be then. Can we identify these two witnesses? I want to tell you this is a slippery road. Okay. One has counted some 12 possible identifications. And many of them, you know what, are very possible. Let us begin by saying that since the Bible does not name them, we don't know who they are and we don't need to know who they are. Right? However, however, there are a few things we have to consider in order to have a pretty good idea of their character, of who actually they would be. Rabbinical commentators in the Midrash Rabbah on Exodus identify the two witnesses in Zechariah as Moses and Aaron. Okay, one political and the other one religious, right? They saw the building of the temple, which many see as the third temple, or the temple of the Messianic times, being led by two people who will act in the spirit, according to them, to Moses and Aaron. Others in the first century is like the Essenes or the Herodians in the Bible from the Dead Sea Scrolls, those who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, identify the two witnesses of Zachariah as two messiahs based on Zerubbabel and based on Joshua. One priest and one that is from the tribe of Levi and the other one from the tribe of Judah. This is whom they expected. You know, rabbinical Judaism do not have the prophecies of the New Testament. Nor do they regard, unfortunately, the prophecies of Daniel which says that the third temple that they are about to build will be destroyed. This is sad because the temple they are about to, be, to prepare right now in Israel, they believe it would be the Messianic temple. This is what, what, what we heard when we went to visit the, the place in Israel. This is why they will believe in the false prophet whom they will consider as the Messiah, and they will believe in the Antichrist, they will consider perhaps as Cyrus or another political leader who will allow them to build that temple. However, gathering information from the New Testament and the Hebrew Scriptures, we can come up with some better picture of the ministry and identification of these two witnesses. Now, when considering the two witnesses, there's one name that comes up, Elijah. According to prophecy, the prophecy of Malachi, chapter 4, verse 5, Elijah comes before the second coming. He says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The Jews expect him to come before the Messiah. This is why, you remember at Passover, there's always an empty chair and a full glass of wine in case he comes, because they believe he would come on the Passover, right? Elijah may be the one of the two witnesses, except perhaps for one important thing that Jesus teaches us. In Matthew eleven fourteen, as he spoke to the multitude about Elijah, he says, if you're willing to accept that he, John the Baptist himself, is Elijah who is to come. John the Baptist is obviously not Elijah. So what did Jesus mean when he said that? The answer is found in Luke 1, 17, when the angel announced the birth of John the Baptist to Zachariah, his father. And there he told him he will also go before him in what? The spirit and the power of Elijah. This tells us that John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah, meaning in fulfilling his ministry of the time. So Elijah will not perhaps need to come physically, but another may come in his spirit. And that Moses, and with Moses, they will complete this ministry. Now, how can we understand, by the way, that John the Baptist is Elijah? You know, when Jesus says, again in Matthew eleven fourteen, 14, if you're willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. See the condition. If you are willing to receive it. This means that one needs to recognize the first coming of the Messiah and needs to go. That means if he does, he doesn't need to go through the tribulation when the two witnesses will be ministering. For the believers will be raptured right after that. So for us, my Elijah was John the Baptist because I accept Jesus as my personal Savior and I expect the rapture to come tonight. If you're willing now to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Yes, it's coming tonight. I don't know if you knew that. 
It's not tonight, it's tomorrow. This is right, always there, always this is urge. I'm looking forward, actually, to see my Lord. No? Furthermore, <coughs> concerning uh, the pair formed by Moses and Elijah, many believe it will be uh, the two of them, especially because the miracles of the two witnesses uh, they perform will be the same, almost the same as those of Moses and Elijah. Like Elijah, we read that the two witnesses will have power to shut the heavens so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. Elijah ju did just that in 1 Kings chapter 17 when he pronounced a three and a half year drought on the land of Israel. Three and a half years being the same amount the time that the two witnesses will be ministering. As for Moses, we read in Revelation 11.6 that the two witnesses will have power to turn water into blood, okay, just like what Moses did, right? And to strike the earth with all plagues, as often as they desire. That's power, by the way. You know, besides Elijah, never died. He never did. He was taken up to heaven, and Moses' body was never found, even though we read in God that God buried him in a valley near Moab in Deuteronomy 34. Furthermore, both Moses and Elijah are seen in the presence of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. All of this seems to point out that Moses and Elijah are very potential candidates for the two witnesses. But both may come in the spirit and it will be two people who will have this power. Others believe it is Enoch and Elijah, right? Because these two never died. Okay, it says uh, on Elijah, 2 Kings 2, 11, another great verse. It says, and it happened as they continued and walked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared uh, with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up uh, by a whirlwind into heaven. What a sight it must have been to those present then. God, you know, always surprises us. He hasn't finished to surprise us, right? Just imagine a fire of char, a fire just showed up and take somebody, right? As for Enoch, we see a wonderful type of those who will not experience death. Those who will be taken at the rapture. We read in Genesis 5, 24, and Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. But could these two be the witnesses in Revelation? As for Enoch, it is kind of doubtful because we read in Hebrews 11.5, it says, By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. If Enoch was taken so that he may not see death, why should he bring him back to see death? Right? In fact, that he did not see death was a whole purpose of his rapture. His departure before death symbolizes for us the rapture. He is the first of those, I believe, whom Paul spoke when he says, we shall not all die. And here's the first. In all, it is preferable, I believe, to see these two individuals as two powerful individuals who will appear during the tribulation time, and they may very well be present in this world today. Based on Zachariah 4, I believe that one would be from the tribe of Levi, and the other will be from the tribe of Judah, like the two witnesses again in Zechariah. Zerubbabel, who is an ancestor of the Messiah from the tribe of Judah, and Joshua, the high priest, who is a descendant of Aaron. It is very possible that both will officiate in the Messianic temple in the millennium. For there will be a prince or a king from a descendant of David alongside Yeshua, and a high priest. Both will minister for a thousand years. It is true that Ezekiel does not mention a high priest, perhaps because there will be no holy of holies, but we can assume that there will be a head priest, for there are many priests working in the Millennium Temple. But there will be two witnesses, perhaps two of the most powerful men ever, to whom will be given enough power to withstand the direct vials of the devil who will be there at the same place and the same time. What will happen happened to them at the end let's read verse 7 and 8 of revelation 11 when they finish their testimony that is once their work is finished once it is accomplished right the beast that ascends out of the bottom pit will make war against them overcome them and kill them 
and their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Like the other prophets, before them they will be killed. Their bodies will lay in the city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. It's actually Jerusalem. By this time, Jerusalem is destroyed, falling into the apostasy, right? Misled by their religious leaders with the worship of the Antichrist and the beast. It will sink into the level of Sodom because of the, this immorality. And down to Egypt, which here symbolizes the world. It reverts back to the world. As for the two witnesses, their death do not last long. It will last how long? Three and a half days. Do, do you see the miracle here? Do you see the touch of grace here? This is like the messianic miracle of Lazarus being done over. There Jesus waited after the third day only. And on the fourth day he resurrected Lazarus. Why did he do that? Because according to their own law, one cannot be considered dead only after the third day. And this is when resuscitation was impossible after the third day. For this is when the cells begin to degenerate. This is what their own law says in the Talmud. It says no evidence of man's death may be tendered before his soul has departed. Even though the witnesses have seen him with the arteries cut or crucified or being devoured by a wild beast. Evidence of identification may be tendered by those only who saw the corpse within three days after death. That's in the Talmud itself. By the way, do you know what this says also? That Jesus is still alive. They couldn't find him after the third day. And yet, as Jesus waited after the third day, so God waits after the third day, three and a half days, to resurrect the two witnesses. And people saw. And so many actually came to believe because of that. We read in verses 11 to 13. Now after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. That's another rapture, right? And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake and the tenth of a city fell. The earthquake, in the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed and the rest listen to this, were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Amen. See, see the effect of their death and resurrection? The rest, a remnant, many of them were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Both the resurrection of Lazarus and the two witnesses prepared the people for the coming of the Messiah, one at the first coming, the other one at the second coming. You know, we learned that in the triumphal entry, do you know why so many Jews came? Do you know why the nation of Israel said that this is the Messiah of Israel? It's because they heard of Lazarus' resurrection. This is in John 12. They heard it and they knew it and they said, this is the messianic miracle. At the end, many will see firsthand the raising of the two witnesses and will come to believe in the Messiah who soon after will appear in heaven. This is the story of the two witnesses. But there's another message we cannot miss in all these prophecies. One which you know, touches each one of us. As Zachariah raises the two witnesses to another level, another dimension, so he does about the work of every believer. Who are the two witnesses today? Or who are the witnesses today, now? Who really is the menorah? We are today the menorah who proclaim and live the word of God in order to share it with others. The whole body of the Messiah is like a menorah attached to the olive tree. Actually, the olive tree is in us now, by the way. Paul speaks of all believers, Jews and Gentiles, as being grafted into what? The olive tree. He must have had in mind the olive tree of Zachariah from which flows the blessings of God. Paul revives this forgotten olive tree. And speaking of Jewish believers, he says that these are the natural branches who through their faith in Yeshua are grafted into their own olive tree, thus becoming the Israel of God. This is where the Messianic Jews are. And on this same olive tree, the Gentiles who are 
who also believe in Yeshua, are grafted in along with the Jewish believer, and together they are blessed by the pouring of the Holy Spirit into their lives. The olive tree in Romans 11 is not Israel, nor is it the church, but it is the place of blessing where both believing Jews and Gentiles come and are grafted in and benefit from the golden oil poured from heaven unto us. This olive tree is found in the scriptures also with Israel. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 2.12. Same teaching. He says that at that time you, that is the Gentiles, were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Because God was there at the time. He declared himself through Israel. And strangers from the covenant of promise having no hope and without God in the world. The word commonwealth, by the way, speaks of a new entity like a state. A citizenship, right? Our citizenship is in heaven, Paul says. This commonwealth is found when we are grafted into the olive tree. This is also important, by the way, for many find it so exclusive when a Jew believes in Jesus. But biblically, actually, it's the opposite. We should find it extraordinary that a Gentile believes in Jesus. You know, the motive of the olive tree not only influenced the history of Israel, but that of other nations. This is why I believe Paul used it. You know, this, th there is a Greek legend about the origin of the olive tree. The tale is that the goddess Athena and Poseidon disputed the honor of giving a name to a certain city of Greece and agreed to settle the question by a trial of which would produce the best gift for the city, this new city. Athena commanded the earth to bring forth the olive tree. And Poseidon commanded the, the sea to bring forth the war horse. Athena's gift was just the better, and so the city was called Athens. While the olive tree symbolizes the blessing of Israel, it also influenced the history of many countries around. And so the testimony of the two witnesses and the light of the menorah whom they are, they also speak also that is of every believer. Jesus said that he is the light of the world. Remember that? but he also said, you are the light of the world. And he said something, something very powerful. He says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. He said that in John 9, 5. But he's not here physically. Who then replaces him? Every single believer. He chose you to be the witness when he said, you are the light of the world. He chose us to be that menorah, that menorah in Zachariah 4. We are the sons of oil. Right? Remember in the original menorah at the tabernacle, Aaron will come every day to take the light from the center, eternal light, right? And with it, light the other six branches. In the same way, every believer is daily actually taking from God through prayer, through Bible reading, through fellowship with Him, and then shares this light with others. You know, the same truth may have prompted David to say something really great in Psalm 52, 8. I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I think he knew what he was talking about. This must have been his best moment of fellowship with God. The rabbis understood the message of the menorah. In the Tamil, they speak of the center light that was always lit as the testimony to mankind that the divine presence is real, rests right there in the temple. On the menorah in Zachariah, a medieval rabbi, Kimki, known as Radak, says that like the candlestick in the law, and the middle one is a type of deity who forms a bond of union to unite contraries. We are united in Yeshua. I will close with this story. While the events of this story may not have happened, they nevertheless represent thousands of stories which must have happened in time. It is the story of a witness who went far up in the Amazon River, and there he spoke of the good news of the Messiah to, the, to some school children. As uh, he talked, an elderly man joined the children and listened who, you know, about God's grace, as it is revealed in the Messiah. After the children were dismissed, the old man came up to the missionary and told, and told him, he says, this is the first time in my life that I have heard that one must give his life to Jesus to have forgiveness from sin and to have life everlasting. But he added, he said, if this is, this is so interesting and interesting story is true, okay, someone should have come before. 
So it cannot be true, he says. I'm an old man, he says. My parents lived their lives and died without ever having heard this message. It cannot be true. And so he left. Turning to make his way back in the darkness of the jungle, repeating the words, it cannot be true. Well, while I believe that every soul, whoever lived, will have his opportunity or opportunity to see and accept salvation from God, it's also true that the burden of proclaiming the word of God is laid upon every single believer. We read in Romans 10, 14, How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You're the preacher. He's not a professional preacher. He's talking to the whole church in Rome here. You are the preacher. This is our task here on earth. Otherwise, we'd have gone to heaven at the moment of our salvation. Amen? Let's bow our head in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are eternal and unchanging, and your love is completely steadfast and faithful, and this to us is so comforting. Thank you for making us one with you, loving us, blessing us, giving us authority and honor and protecting us. And Lord, we ask that you would grant us great faith in these times and the power to be obedient to you, to follow your word. Work that work of conviction in our hearts. Produce in us these, these attitudes which will cause us to live in ways that bring you glory. Me, we understand what we have. Beshem Yeshua Mashiach. And to the congregation, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you.